When Kobe Bryant, his daughter, and seven other passengers were tragically killed in that helicopter crash on the 26th of January of 2020, the world was painfully reminded of this reality, that it doesn't matter who you are, death touches everyone. In fact, I was reading just an article the other day about Kelly Billups in Ohio. She's 54 years old. On the 29th of March of this year, her 51-year-old brother, David, died. And then, just two days after that, and just hours apart, both her parents died also. Almost her entire family was wiped out by COVID-19. It has destroyed my family, she said. It feels like a nightmare. And sadly, her story represents the experience of thousands. All of us, at some point in our lives, will stand by the grave of someone we love and we will ask this question, is this the end? Is there any hope after death? Ask people around you what happens when you die and you will receive a variety of different answers. The destination of the dead is different all over the world. Many Christians believe that the soul goes straight to heaven upon death or straight to hell. Others believe in a place called purgatory, a kind of intermediate space between heaven, or at least before heaven, for cleansing. And then, of course, there's another place called limbo, which is for those who are not good enough for heaven, but not bad enough for hell. Some religions teach that the afterlife is spent in a place called paradise. And others still believe that, well, death is just simply the end. Over half the world's population today believes in the idea of reincarnation after death. This is the idea that after you die, your soul can live on in another life form on planet Earth. And so depending on how good you were in this life, your next life can either be a higher or a lower form. That might make you think twice about killing a cockroach. Near-death experiences have also complicated the situation. Many say that they have felt a sensation of floating or lifting up out of their bodies and entering into a sphere of bright light and beauty. And if the media is to be any guide on this subject, well, shows like Crossing Over and films like Help My House is Haunted have popularized the idea that you can talk to the dead. And Disney is a big promoter of this idea too. The internet, books, board games feature discussions with the dead, so much so that the dead really look more alive than dead. Mediums and spirit guides hotly sought after by so many people today so that they can help them communicate with deceased loved ones. Are the dead really dead? Does the Bible offer us any answers on this subject? It does. And knowing the answer is critical. When we go to the end of the Bible, we find a significant clue in our quest for truth on this subject. Notice what it says in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, Jesus says, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. If anyone knows anything about what happens when you die, it is Jesus. Because he has died and the Bible tells us he rose again. We do not have to be afraid of death because Jesus has conquered the tomb. And not only that, but the Bible says he has the keys. He holds them and there is hope because he does. Now, before we explore and understand the mystery of death, let's first try and understand the equation of life. When I was in high school, we had to read Mary Shelley's goth gothic novel masterpiece, Frankenstein. It was published in 1818, and I had to read it for English studies. And the entire novel centers around one man's obsessive passion for trying to discover the formula for life. But the Bible beat him to it. Listen to what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. It says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. God formed us. It's like he wanted us to know we're special. He didn't speak us into existence. He personally fashioned and formed us. At creation, the Bible says, God formed the body of, from dust and then he breathed into that body and man became, doesn't say he was given, but he became a living being or a living soul. If we were going to express this, this concept that we've just read mathematically, we might say that the formula for life looks something like this. Dust, 
plus breath equals a living soul or a living being. The Bible doesn't say that God put a soul into man. It says he breathed into him the breath of life and man became a living soul. A living soul simply means a living person. That's why sometimes we use this expression when we might be walking in a park and there wasn't a soul in sight, we say. What we mean by that is there wasn't a living person in sight. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 4 adds this. God says, behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. And then he says, the soul who sins shall die. Souls, according to the Bible, die. Therefore, the soul is simply the union of body and breath. When a person dies, the Bible says their soul dies. They die. There is no such thing, the Bible says, as an immortal soul. You won't find a reference to an everlasting soul, an eternal soul, an immortal soul. In fact, the Bible references the soul 1600 times and not once does it ever say that we have our immortal souls. In fact, notice what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. It says now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. God, the Bible teaches, is eternal. We are mortal. That means we are subject to death and disease. But God is not like us. First Timothy 6, 15 and 16 adds, He who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone, the Bible says, who alone has immortality dwelling in unapproachable light. God is the only one who has immortality. That is, he's the only one who cannot die. The hope of the Bible is that when we come to this immortal God, he gives to us an, a promise of immortality, the promise of an immortal life. And when Jesus comes, the Bible tells us, he will give to us the gift of immortality. The Bible teaches very plainly that death is actually like a sleep. People who say they sleep like a baby usually don't have one. But in death, or rather in sleep, five minutes or five hours, they feel like the same thing. And so when the Bible says death is like a sleep for the believer who dies, death is, means it is a sleep for them where they are as secure as if they were sleeping in the arms of Jesus. We do not need to fear death because death is just the sleep. And the Bible tells us this over 50 times. In Psalm 13 verse 1, the Bible says, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, says the psalmist, lest I sleep the sleep of death. And then, of course, when speaking of the death of King David, the Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 10, So David rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. When we die, when we die as Christians, death is a rest in the arms of Jesus. We have this expression in English where we say we were, when we sleep, it's like we're dead to the world because in sleep you have no concept of time or what's happening around you. So when the Bible says that death is like a sleep, it's because it is a sleep. Death is truly resting in peace. And friends, if the formula for life is dust of the ground plus the breath of life equals a living soul, well, then we can say that the formula for death is simply the reverse, it's creation in reverse. And the equation would look something like this. Dust minus breath equals a lifeless soul or a lifeless being. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse seven says this, then the dust will return to the earth as it was and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Does the soul go back to God? No. And here's where many pe people become confused. They think the soul and the spirit are the same thing, but the Bible doesn't teach that. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for spirit is ruach, which simply means breath. The ruach is not a conscious entity or something that thinks and feels. The spirit and the soul are different. God breathed his life-giving power into man, and at death, the power of life goes back to God. 
When God breathed into man, he became a living soul. And at death, the soul dies and the power goes back to God. The life-giving power goes back to God. The Bible teaches that the breath and the spirit are the same. Not the spirit and the soul are the same, but the breath and the spirit are the same. Job chapter 27 verse 3 says, As long as my breath is in me and the breath of God in my nostrils, or James 2 verse 26 puts it this way, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So upon death, the body goes back to dust and the spirit, the life-giving energy of God, the Bible teaches us, returns to God who gave it. Let me illustrate it like this. If you have a light globe, and you have electricity and you plug that light globe into some electrical current, you will have light. But if you unplug that globe that from electricity, the light will cease to exist. And so it is with the Spirit of God. When a person dies, that spirit or the power for living goes back to God and conscious life ceases to exist. The Bible teaches us that there is no consciousness in the sleep of death. Psalm 146 verse 4 says this, His spirit departs. He returns to his earth. In that very day, his plans perish. And Ecclesiastes 9, 5 and 6 is a powerful text on this subject. It says, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know how much? Nothing. They know nothing. And they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, their envy have now perished. Never more will they have a share in anything done under the sun. Why don't the dead know anything? Because they're asleep. That's why. Death is asleep. And if they went to heaven or they went to hell, by the way, they would know more than the living. And that would make this text wrong. The Bible says the dead know nothing. And you'd think that if people went to heaven when they died, that they would have some sort of happy emotions, right? Well, the Bible here says that they don't have any emotion. Their thoughts perish, their love, their hatred, their envy, it all perishes at death. Perhaps one of the most touching stories that helps us to understand what the Bible teaches on this subject happened in the story which tells us of what Jesus did when he came to raise Lazarus from the dead. In John chapter 11, a friend of Jesus, Lazarus, fell deathly sick. His sisters sent word to Jesus and said, please come quickly. He whom you love is sick. And this is what the Bible says in verse 11 of John chapter 11. These things he said, that is Jesus. And after that, he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought he was speaking about taking a rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. When Jesus reached the hometown of Lazarus, Lazarus had been dead for four long, painful days and his sisters were grieving. And when Martha meets Jesus, that's the sister of Lazarus, she comes to him and she says to him words that tell us that she got her understanding about what happens when you die straight from Jesus because she said to him in John 11 verse 24, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Martha believed that death was asleep until the resurrection. But notice what Jesus says to her in verses 25 and 26. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? The resurrection of Lazarus is proof to us that Jesus will raise our believing loved ones one day when he comes. Our loved ones who died believing in Jesus are secure and resting in him till he wakes them up. And think about it. If Lazarus had been in heaven for four days, it would be kind of cruel for Jesus to call him back now. In fact, Lazarus probably wouldn't have wanted to come back even if Jesus told him to. He might have even written a book on what heaven was like had Jesus called him down from heaven. But no such book exists because Lazarus didn't go to heaven for four days. Jesus didn't say, Lazarus, come down or Lazarus, come up. He said, Lazarus, come forth. 
And if he hadn't put his name in that call, every grave might have split open at the call of the life giver. There is such power in the word of God. In fact, I love this story. I have to share it with you. As a young man, Dwight Moody, he was called upon at short notice to preach a funeral sermon. And so he went searching frantically through the Bible, trying to find a funeral sermon that Jesus preached so that he could use it in his sermon. But he could not find a single one. Instead, he discovered that every single sermon, every single funeral that Jesus ever attended, he broke up because death could not exist where he was. The great hope of the Bible is that death is asleep from which Jesus will wake us up from. The Bible tells us that there is the promise of a resurrection when Jesus comes for his friends. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 says this, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Jesus promises to us that death is not the end. There is hope beyond the grave because Jesus is coming again. This is why in Colossians 3, 3 and 4, the Bible says, For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, you will also appear with him in glory. If we have surrendered our lives to Jesus, then our life is secure with Christ him in death. In death, our identity is safe. God will not forget us. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52 says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, that's like in the blinking of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. God will make us all over new and he will give us new and healthy bodies when Jesus comes. And you say, wait a minute, Shirsa, this is all sounding really good. I like what you're saying, but you've forgotten something. What about the thief on the cross? Remember what the Bible says in Luke 23, verse 43? It says, and Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And that's a good point. I'm glad you raised it. Well, this verse reads very differently depending on where you place the comma. You see, in the Greek language, the punctuation wasn't put in until 1400 years after Christ. And so the real question is, where should the comma go? You see, on Sunday morning, Jesus told Mary on the day of his resurrection, he told Mary Magdalene, who was first at the tomb, this in John 20, verse 17. He said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and to your father, to my God and your God. So now we have a bit of a problem because either Jesus is lying to the thief or he is lying to Mary or the comma is in the wrong place. And we know already that Jesus didn't lie. Jesus never lied. So it's like this. If I have a sentence, a woman without her man is nothing and I put some commas in there, it can change the meaning of the sentence. For example, a woman, comma, without her, comma, man is nothing. Completely different meaning. The placing of a comma makes all the world of difference. And so if the Bible has hundreds of verses in it that tell us that the dead know nothing, that death is asleep, their thoughts and their, their affections perish, well, then we must put the comma, not where the translators put it, but we must put the comma where Jesus put it. Jesus said to the thief, I tell you today. As the blood is dripping down my face and as nails are piercing my hands, I tell you today when it doesn't look like I can save anyone, I tell you today when it looks like I'm a common criminal, I assure you today you will be with me in paradise when I come. This idea of an immortal soul is a lie spun by the devil himself. He's the father of lies. In fact, remember that for every truth, of God, Satan has a counterfeit. Satan was the one who in the Garden of Eden, the Bible told us he told Eve in Genesis 3 verse 4, if you disobey God, you will not surely die. Paganism embraced this lie. 
The Greeks believed this lie and now modern day spiritualism operates on this lie, the belief that we possess an immortal soul. In fact, listen to what a spiritualist E.W. Sprague said. He said, spiritualism says the dead know more than the living. He then quotes Genesis 3 verse 4 and he says, in this, as in many other Bible passages, the devil told the truth and the Lord is in error. Wow. God did not tell a lie. God was not in error. The devil is lying. And this is why in God's word, God cautions us to have nothing to do with those who teach or claim that they can communicate with the dead. Deuteronomy 18, 10 to 11 and 12 says, There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls upon the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. God doesn't want you watching TV shows about this stuff, reading books about this stuff, playing games with this stuff, because it's not just simple stuff. This is the activity of demons. God says it's extremely dangerous. And since the dead are really dead, when so many people today think they are communicating with the dead, who are they really communicating with? Revelation 16 verse 14 says, for they are the spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. People are not communicating with their deceased loved ones. When they communicate with the dead, the Bible tells us they're communicating with fallen angels, with demons. God's word makes it clear. These are just demons masquerading as their deceased loved ones. And this is a cruel deception if you think about it. But if we don't know the truth about what happens when you die as the Bible shares it with us, then it leaves us wide open to believing this lie. The Bible predicts that before the end of the world comes in the last days, demons will go out into the world to deceive many. God's word is so much better than every other way that there could possibly be. In the book of Job, Job 14, verse 21, it says, In death his sons come to honor him, and he does not know it. They are brought low, and he does not perceive it. Imagine how painful heaven would be if when people died and went to heaven, they could watch their loved ones go through hell on earth. God is too loving to let our loved ones go through that. And so death is just a dreamless, peaceful sleep from which Jesus will wake us up from when he comes. Psalm 115 verse 17 says, The dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. This is what God's word teaches. It is crystal clear. The dead do not go to heaven. They rest in peace. Death is like pressing pause on a video player or on, a, on an iPod. It's like pre pressing pause on a video. The next thing that the dead in Christ will know is the return of Jesus when he comes, when the resurrection happens. And so Jesus has taken the sting out of death for us. Death is not a dead end anymore. Thanks to Jesus, real joy awaits us on the other side of sorrow. For this reason, 1 Corinthians 15, 55 and 57 says, O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the hope of the Christian. A man's daughter called her local minister to ask him to come and pay a visit to her dad who was very, very sick. And so as the minister arrived, he knocked on the door. The man said, come in. And he walked in and he noticed that the man who was lying in the bed had a chair beside the bed and he said, oh, I see you've been expecting me. And the old man said, I'm sorry, I beg your pardon. And the minister explained, I'm sorry, I thought you had the chair there because you knew I was coming. Ah, the man said, he said, please close the door. I have something to tell you about that chair. So the minister closed the door, took his seat and the man began to tell him his story. I've never told anybody this, but not even my daughter, the man said, but 
for the longest time, I haven't known how to pray. And it's been a real struggle for me. For years, I couldn't do it. And so one day I confided in my best friend. And he said to me, Joe, prayer is simple. It's a matter of having a conversation with Jesus. Here's what I suggest. And my friend told me to sit down in a chair and place a chair opposite me and imagine by faith that I could see Jesus sitting in that chair. He said, it's not spooky because Jesus promised he would be with us always. And so I did that. I put the chair in front of me and I talked to Jesus like he was sitting there. And ever since, I've never had a problem with prayer. In fact, I really enjoy it so much that now I spend many hours every day just talking to Jesus. And I imagine that he's sitting in that chair. Well, the minister was pretty touched by this story. He prayed with this man and he left. Two days later, he received a phone call from the man's daughter. She rang to tell him that her father had just passed away. She said, it happened so quickly. I, I left to go to the store and when I came back, he was gone. The minister wanted to know, was, was it a peaceful passing? She said, yes, but there was something strange about the way he went. She said, when I came into the room, daddy had leaned over and his head wasn't on the pillow. His head was on the chair. Friends, the Bible teaches us that death is nothing to be afraid of because if we know Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life, then death is just a peaceful sleep from which Jesus will wake us up from. The real question is, do you believe in Jesus? Because if you do, death is not the end. It is just a pause, a peaceful sleep, and the next thing you know will be the face of Jesus.